Okay, it's time for the July recent release roundup. I do these every month. If you're new here, where I just take a handful of new releases from the previous month and I go onto the internet, specifically booktube, and I look for reviews and I try to get the general buzz and reception of these works. I talk about themes and tropes that people bring up. I do not talk about synopses. If you want that, I do have a Goodreads shelf linked down below. You can go find synopses there. And I will have the reviews that I mentioned that I have watched all linked down below with timestamps for the books that I will talk about. And we will now jump into this video because these are always a bit longer. I think I have 11 to talk about today because July, I think, wasn't as intense as August or June because, oh my goodness, I'm already like intimidated about how many books I'm about to buy when I do the August video because that's what happens is I make these videos and I almost always want to bring a book or two home. <laughs> It, it, it happens. I actually just did that today and I'll bring that up when I get to that book. And I usually go from books with the most ratings on Goodreads to the least. So we go from very buzzy to maybe hidden gem, you know, that sort of thing. And so I'm sure you're not surprised that the first book we're going to talk about is Upgrade by Blake Crouch, which I mean, when I last checked had over 22,000 ratings. I'm sure it's even greater than that now. It's a book of the month book and it's Blake Crouch. So it's going to do pretty well. Um, and actually, though, the reception of this book has been mixed, but not negative. So the reviews I have are Tori, Tori Morrow, Michael Nip, Thomas from SFF 180, Larry Has Opinions, and Rachel Kalanati in one of her weekly wrap-ups. And all of these people I love. These are all booktube friends, and I love watching all of their reviews. And so it was really interesting hearing what did and didn't work for each of them, and especially with their experience with this author, because I think, so Tori and Michael both really like Blake Crouch works. They both really like Dark Matter. They like the sci-fi thriller aspect. And they both enjoyed this work, but it, it wasn't without caveats. There was definitely some pacing things that they weren't expecting because they're used to the more action-paced thrillerness of his works. And this one, I think, gets more contemplative and tries to be more like an ideas sci-fi at times, specifically around genetics and the idea of what is it to upgrade a person? What are the ethics behind that? Um, so... I think there's some pacing inconsistency there and that the focus on the thematic issues meshed with the popcorn fun that he normally brings to his books, I think I got that phrasing from Michael Nip's review, is at war with itself at times. So I think this is a book that Blake Crouch fans are going to like, but I don't necessarily think that when people make their internal like, this was my favorite by this author list, that it's their favorite, at least so far from the Blake Crouch fans that are putting out reviews. And then Thomas and Rachel, I think, respect how popular this is, but it's not like a favorite author of those. And they thought it was a good time. Rachel actually really liked a lot of the science info dumping around the genetics, which has me cautiously optimistic that I could like it. Sometimes Blake Crouch's approach to sci-fi doesn't work to me. I think for thriller, it's okay. I don't, it, it truly depends. And I'm very close to like biomedical sciences and genetics. So like, it could go either way for me personally as a reader. And actually these thematic questions are some of my favorite to look at in sci-fi. And I don't quite know if he would approach it the way that I would want it approached. But her saying that actually helps me think I might like it a bit more. So yeah, check out those reviews. I'm sure there will be many more to come because it's going to be a book that people keep picking up. It's going to be very popular. It's probably going to win the Goodreads Choice Award for sci-fi. <laughs> You know, I'm just going to put that out there now. It is a contender. <laughs> but it's good that one of the anticipated releases of the year has not been a complete dud, because if you missed last month's video, there were some disappointments out there. And we're now going to switch to a hidden gem of a sci-fi called Ymir, which is, I believe, a loosely nod retelling to Beowulf based off Rachel's review and Whimsy Dearest and some good reads that I read, because this has actually not been reviewed on BookTube that much, but I wanted to bring it up because it seems like it's going to be a hidden gem sort of thing. And it's one of those sci-fi stories where you really are dealing with a different race or species of individual. These are not humans that we're following. It also has a grimdark character, I think. I think it's going to be one of those um, characters that you're either going to love following them because they're so messy and just like not necessarily a likable protagonist, or you're going to not like following them because of all the qualities they bring. I don't know how I'll feel because when I was looking at reviews, I did notice that this character, because of reasons, has some drug abuse problems, and that can sometimes be a little bit triggering for me. But then Whimsy Darius did bring up that it is truly about the balance and the changing and growth of this brother relationship that's on page. So I'm curious, and the fact that Rachel from Shades of Orange really liked it, really speaks highly of it. She really loves stuff that's different and unique, which is typically what I really like from world building and sci-fi and fantasy. So definitely check those out. This is a standalone, and I don't think it's that long, and it has really good world building, especially if you like the grittier, grimmer parts of the speculative genre. I think you really should try it out. 
All right, this next one is also very popular, also was a book of the month pick, and that's Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow, which a lot of people were loosely comparing to Ready Player One, but I don't think this is as speculative as people think it's going to be. I'm not going to say that it doesn't have any of those qualities, but very few people brought those up in the reviews. <laughs> so I have to imagine it's mainly only an aesthetic or something, and maybe the Ready Player One comparisons are more because it's about video game creation, and when Ready Player One is very about being in video games, I think. I haven't read Ready Player One. Regardless, this seems to be a contemporary that is hitting more than it's missing, especially because it seems to stick the landing of the whole story, which is, I think, actually a big selling point for me. I don't know if I'll pick it up, but it does have a lot of themes that are buzzwords for me. So Sin's Book Nook was the first review I watched for this, and she discusses how this is thematically following the journey of these two friends throughout their life through, like, loss, coming together, creating a game, dealing with fame. What does that do? And I kind of like those type of stories, like, especially in a contemporary setting. I... I enjoy following people through time and dealing with that, and I think, I, I just think that's an interesting premise, and I am really intrigued that the ending might work. Now, that said, I did hear from Fraser that some of the middle really didn't work for him. Like, he had an interesting trajectory when he talked about it in his weekly update, so you want to check that out. I think it had to do with maybe pseudo-love triangles or maybe miscommunication trope, potentially like that. Maybe not, like, what you would expect in, like, a young adult story, but it's definitely probably one of those things where if you're just like, oh my gosh, just talk to each other, it sounds like there are some tensions that could have been resolved by just talking to each other. So if that's one of your anti-buzzwords, just know that that is in this book. And another thing to be aware of is I think one of our main characters is disabled. And I found one review that I'll link down below. I believe it's by, uh, I think it's Kendra Winchester. And if I'm wrong, I'll correct myself on the screen. But she talked about the disability representation in this work and how she was a little disappointed in it. Um, I believe one of our main characters, I, can't, I think, needs to have an amputation of one of their limbs or has already had it amputated. And I think she was just disappointed in how it was represented. I don't think I have the words for that, but I want to bring that review to your attention. I will have that more marked in the description just because she was both excited that this was part of the story, but also disappointed. But she made it very clear in her response that it doesn't necessarily make this a bad book. It wasn't egregious. But I think it's important when people discuss this type of representation in stories, especially stories this popular. But this seems like a book that if you like exploring relationship dynamics, if you want a book that maybe will resonate more with your life experience as a millennial, because I feel like we're finally starting to get this whole like renaissance of literature and literary contemporary works that like relate to like what it was like for us to grow up and things like that. I feel like that'll be here. There was some interesting commentary on like cultural appropriation and things like that. That was at Kayla's Reads and Work in Progress. She had a very well thought out review. She's a really small channel that I just discovered. So really check that out. I thought it was a really interesting way of like doing a review and trying to spark discussion. So yeah, I will have all the reviews that I watched for this. I, I still don't know if I'll buy it, but it is one of those things that like, if I ever felt like this type of thing, like I was itching for it and it was available at the library, I could be convinced to pick it up. This next one is one that I purchased today, and that is <laughs> August Kitko and the Mechas. And part of it is because in my Discord, one of my patrons read it and loved it, and their description of it, of just how it's just like a fun, flashy space opera time, I was just like, yes. Also, it has mechs. And if you don't know me, my entire being is like, where's my Pacific Rim book? <laughs> And I don't know if this will be it, but it seems to have a lot of the trope overlap. There seems to be this connection between aliens and humans to try to form together to run these ships or something. So it's close. So it's maybe going to focus on those relationships. I did hear in Audrey's review at Perpetual Pages that maybe that could have been expanded on. I do like that music is part of this connection because our main character is a jazz pianist. The cover is just like... Like, how do you not? How do you not, like, at least attempt to pick it up? And I did read for myself the first, like, five pages at the bookstore today, and I'm like, yeah, I think, I think I like this style. I think I'm going to vibe with it. I also have the reviews for Rachel from Shades of Orange and Barkhart Bookshelf, and yeah, just, even though Audrey and Rachel were more like three, three and a half star reviews for it, I think it could be at least a four star experience for me. It just looks like it's going to be fun and imaginative and a great time, and yeah, I just... It looks fun and it looks like it has a lot of my tropes and like sci-fi elements that I've been wanting to explore more in a while so I, I'm hoping it's a hit for me. This next one's actually a reprint but I just saw it in the wild and hardcover and I was really curious about it so I wanted to talk about it anyways and that's The Mermaid of Black Conch and this is stunning. This is a Trinidad story and it looks amazing. This is definitely probably more of your like literary reflective fantasy works so I would definitely go into it with like that man mindset. It's not just like fantasy mermaids. I mean, the mer the main character's a mermaid. 
Like, that's happening. Like, that's part of the story. She was cursed, I think, by her village to become a mermaid. And then we're set in the present day. I did hear that the first chapter, too, is rough in terms of how the mermaid is treated. But once she's integrated with this village, it's a lot of literal, like, fish out of water, getting to know each other. Lots of commentary on, like, things you can learn from folklore and your ancestors and your history. And, oh, there was a lot of stuff that I really liked from the reviews that I saw. It was apparently a really tender love story, which, like, I'm kind of here for good themes for approaching colonialism. I think one of the main characters is one of the rich colonizers on this island. And so, yeah, I'm very curious about it. I'm glad it got reprinted. It was up for a bunch of awards when it first came out, I think a couple years ago. And so, yeah, this cover is really pretty. When it's in paperback, I might be nominating it for my book club to read because I think it's like going to be a really good discussion book club book. And yeah, it's definitely going to scratch that like literary itch for me. And I just... Caribbean stories are so fun. One of my favorite stories is like Once on this Island, and this harkens me back to that sort of type of story, and I'm always in the mood for that. And up next we have, <laughs> this one's my controversial one, I think, of the month. I think this is the one that's like the most controversial. Yeah, let me see. Oh, there's, there's one more maybe that's a little more controversial, but this one's up there, and that's The Book of Gothel. And I think what I've gathered is even from people who like it, this is maybe not marketed appropriately. <laughs> so you see this cover, there, there's a long braid of hair. It's supposed to be about the mother of Rapunzel, which it is. It is. But I think the marketing makes you think it's another one of those origin retelling of a villain in a story sort of thing. And in relationship to Rapunzel, maybe. And I think the Rapunzel part is like this much at the end of the book. So it's mostly about Mother Gothel as a child. And it's mostly commentary and like a historical fantasy on what it's like to be a woman in the medieval era. I think specifically Germany. And so I think for some people, that's great. They really liked that commentary. It, I, a lot of people mentioned Bear and the Nightingale vibes. Like I was getting that vibes when people were just talking to me about the book, but in reviews that I saw, people were comping it to Bear and the Nightingale, but maybe not as lyrically written. But that type of historical fantasy where it's not necessarily about the fantastical, there are definitely folklore elements. There's definitely maybe some magic and pagan stuff, but it's not necessarily like fantasy with a capital F sort of thing. And so... I think I might try this, but I can see why it's not working for a lot of people who are maybe expecting a different story. I hear the pacing's a little uneven, even from people who liked it. Um, Gothel's a teenager and sometimes makes teenager decisions, which I think can rub people one way or the other. And I just think that if you go into this book with the wrong expectations, you're, you're going to be disappointed, which I definitely did see in a few reviews. And most people, I think, felt that the ending was a tiny bit rushed. But I'm still interested in it. And I think this cover is really pretty. Like, I get why they chose this cover. This is a very pretty cover. <laughs> At least I think it is. I think it's very striking. So I am interested in it. But I think I'm going into it more with a mindset like I do when I go into, like, Circe or Kai Kei or something like that than I do, um, ironically, The Bear and the Nightingale or Spinning Silver or something. Even though I think it's probably comped closer to those. But I feel like I am thinking of it outside of the fantasy genre a bit more based off the reviews I've seen. And I have had reviews that are positive, negative, and in between. I believe Rambling Reader, not so keen on it. Uh, Bethany, three and a half stars-ish, has a vlog about it. Brighton Bookish, really liked it. And then I think Hannah Blackwell was somewhere in the middle. So you have all of those. And I know Elliot's going to be talking about it soon. And same with Roger at Roger's Reads. I just don't have videos for them yet. But they have talked to me <laughs> about them. And I know Roger has his good reads up. So I will have them linked so you can be sure to check their channels. But yeah, Elliot loved it. And Roger did not. <laughs> and actually, I know um, Brittany from Books with Brittany also really liked it recently. But I don't think it's been in a vlog or a wrap-up yet. So like I said, all over the place. The reviews for this just everywhere. Up next is a book that I felt like I wanted to talk about because I do have some things to say, but a lot of people didn't really say much in a lot of their reviews, and that's A Prayer for the Crown Shine. I think part of that is it's a sequel, and I feel like people, like, are scared of spoiling the first book, but I, I truly, having read the first novella, I don't know what you spoil in it because there, there's not really a plot. Like, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but I got some information that made me think about picking this next one up since I was, like, I, the first one was fine. It was four stars. Like, I didn't have too many thoughts about it. But this one seems to have more of an objective purpose. There seems to be a goal, which I just like in stories. I In life, I don't think you need to have that, which is why, like, I understand the point of the first book. But in a book, it's kind of something I like sometimes. And this one's theme, I think, might resonate with me a bit more. And that theme seems to be 
that you do not have to exist just to produce. And I still think that's something that I'm trying to resonate on the regular. Like just the other day, I felt so guilty for leaving work when I had nothing left to do. Like, <laughs> so maybe this theme will resonate more with me than you don't need a purpose, which is kind of the first book's sort of thing. So still cozy sci-fi. If you like Becky Chambers, you're still gonna like this one. I've got um, Beckel Books, Bethany, and Frasier's reviews down below if you want to see them. But like I said, everyone's been very brief about it, but in general, most people have liked this more than the previous book. So, and next up, we've got A Strange and Stubborn Endurance, which I really liked. <laughs> I do also have a few other reviews. I have Princess Paperback and I have Nerdy Nurse Reads. And I think a thing that the book is upfront about and every reviewer has been upfront about, and I think Nursey Nurse Reads actually took this opportunity to take this book review and also talk about content warnings, is that content warnings are required for this book, at least if you usually need them. There's a page at the front where the author tells you content warnings, and then you can choose to read those content warnings. You can choose to not read them. I will say... The first instance of them is earlier in the book than I think most people think it will happen. Chapter two is a hard chapter for a lot of people. It happens really early on. It really sets up where our character is going to need to heal and grow from for the rest of the story. I will say that if you read the content warnings, you're like, oh, that's really rough. It's most graphic. I'm not saying it doesn't exist anywhere else, but it's most graphic in chapter two. And then you can probably get the gist without having to see the graphicness of it, like the on-page-ness. I'm being vague in case you really don't want content warnings. But after you get through that, this is a romance, a fantasy romance that's about love. It's about healing. It's about growing. It has a really fun political plot. I do think most people don't love the reveal. I was fine with it. I mean, I kind of saw it coming. And I actually, like, it kind of made sense to me. But I also, like, when I read political fantasy romance, I'm rarely there for the mystery or the politics. But I did think that the plot was set up in a way that kept my characters, my like romantic pairing, engaging with each other. And I, I really enjoyed that personally, that I kept having situations for them to be with each other, getting to know each other. Um, our one character is learning a whole new country, so it was a way for him to get to know the country by traveling around and trying to unpack things. So I thought it was a good plot for facilitating this relationship building. There's also a stunning platonic relationship in this book that I really loved. I was really nervous about it because for me, I was nervous that if it was going to be done well because it's between one of our married characters and his valet. And, you know, power imbalance, how's this going to be handled? And I just think their story is equally as touching as the romance in this. So yeah, I think the, the two things that I are the most sticking points for people is the ending reveal. So if you're like way more, my plots need to be like more tight or less predictable person, that might be an issue for you. And also just the fact that some of the content warnings are on page and are heavy and hard to read for some people. So just know that it is the first page of the book. And if you want to know it, you can ask me, I will tell you exactly what the author says. I'm just being vague in case some people truly like to go into something knowing nothing, although it's a romance and romances generally spoil themselves, <laughs> like in terms of their tropes and the discussion for that. Another thing I want to mention is that the country that we do end up spending the majority of the time in is very LGBTQ friendly, very pro consent. And it's just like, it was nice. It was a nice world to be in. So many Neil pronouns, just, just a great time. Next up's a novella. This is What Moves the Dead, which honestly, surprisingly to me, had the most reviews for me to like find when I do the search. Like what I do is I type in the title name and go book review and I see what I see. And sometimes I have to look through vlogs and wrap ups. This one had a lot of standalone reviews. I was expecting Upgrade to be that, but it was this one. Um, we have Grace Dion, who I love. We have Brad Proctor. We have, it's Allie Do Is Read, but I think it's a play on All I Do Is Read. And I like, I love that. <laughs> Tina from Sounds and Fury, Brighton Bookish, Whimsy Dearest. So, so many reviews. And most of these people read the, um, what's it called? Fall of the House of Usher by Edgar Allan Poe before reading this novella. Which, I mean, yeah, if I was doing a reading vlog for that, I would probably have done the same thing. I love Edgar Allan Poe short stories. I think he's like one of my favorite classic short story authors. Really gets the ominous tone down right. Like so, so compelling, so creepy. I don't remember this story. It's been years since I've read it. And it seems that you don't need to read it for the novella, that the novella does evoke the atmosphere, does take a lot of the key things from the short story and just expands on it by making it a novella instead of a short story. But I will say Brad Proctor's review found that he appreciated the novella more by having read the original work first. 
So it's up to you. No one said that reading the short story spoiled their experience of the novella, which is something I would have been nervous about. It's like, well, what if I just kind of want to go in ignorant, you know, like, what if I just don't want to know that much? And it seems that like the novella definitely stays true to the tone and the atmosphere and some of the themes, but it definitely goes its own way, has its own twists, its own answers, its own questions to ask, it has its own world. This is a world that's more flushed out with its backstory. It has um, different pronouns for characters and for their different gender identities. So I think there's enough different from it that reading the inspiration won't be that won't be that big a deal. And a lot of people did say that it was pretty creepy in tone to them, but obviously every person's different. Mileage is going to vary on if you find this scary. So yeah. Um, oh, I just also wanted to mention that when one of these reviews, I do believe it was all I do is read. She mentioned that Poe loves a good comma. And I, that made me chuckle. I, I, I just wrote it down because it made me laugh. <laughs> so yeah, it just, I'm excited to read it. I didn't want to go too much more in depth than that because I just want to read it because I love Tegan Fisher, but I was happy to notice in these reviews that everyone was like, by the way, if you love Tegan Fisher's humor and tone, that is still here. It is creepy, but it's still got that funny humor. It still has that, like, sometimes the animals have personality, which I'm always here for. Apparently in this, it's a horse. People kept mentioning the Tangled horse from, like, the movie Tangled, and I'm like, okay, I'm in. I'm so in. I'm ready for October because I'll probably read it. I'll probably read it then. Speaking of another spooky story, we have Just Like Home by Sarah Gailey, which I read, and this is also controversial. <laughs> People are loving and hating the ending left and right. It is five stars. It is two stars. This is the range. <laughs> um, I have Fraser Simmons. I have Books and Lala. I have Whimsy Dearest. I have Aaron Megan. I have Judith, and I have Bethany. Bethany and Fraser love this. Books and Lala wasn't as much of a fan. <laughs> I think I'm like a four star range. And I feel like Whimsy Dearest and I agree the most on this. And so it's, it's a horror and you don't want to talk about too many plot points, right? You don't want to spoil it. And that's why I avoided reviews for so long. But I will say if you like a book that is very atmospheric and set in place, that was the thing I really took away from the beginning of this story is like, I feel being in this house. I understand every inch of this place and her relationship to it, which is my favorite way to be in a setting. It's not just how does it look? How does it feel? How do you relate to being in the setting? I think that's done masterfully. So if that's like something you love from like your haunted house stories, like it definitely had some creepy moments. There was definitely a chapter I read that I shouldn't have read before bed. But also I read this with my friend Jocelyn and she didn't really like get scared at all. <laughs> But she also admits that not many things scare her. So <laughs> there is that. And part of the reason for the ending for some people, like for me, is that I would have liked it to be fleshed out a bit more. Um, and there's actually an element that was in the story that didn't work as well for me. But if you want a character that like you don't know what her deal is, this is a fascinating character. And I would actually go into this book knowing very little, not even read the flap, because that's what was fun for me. It's like I knew it was a woman going home. It's a creepy house. That's what I knew. And unpacking, wait, what happened in her family? Why was she away from home for so long? Why does this town act the way they do around her? Like I was answering all these questions that I think are in the flap of the book. And it was, and then trying to figure out, wait, who are you as a person? Like what, what? <laughs> like she's, it's, it's really an exploration of messed up families and dark pasts and maybe darker selves. And it does some interesting things. I really like thematically what it's doing. And so it might be worth a shot and you can definitely like read a chapter two and you know, with the sample pages and see if the writing will work for you. So I can't guarantee you'll like it because a lot of people don't like the ending, but a lot of people love the ending. So maybe you should just read it to find out. <laughs> and I didn't actually realize that when I was doing these readings, like all of the horror-ish stuff would be back to back, but our last one's more of a gothic horror and that's Our Wives Under the Sea. And so this one I think is more literary gothic horror than it is speculative horror, but you decide. Um, my favorite review for this was Books and Bow, but I just, I love their channel. Their channel is like my favorite literary fiction channel. And they also read a lot of the speculative literary stuff that I like to read. But yeah, essentially there is a lesbian couple and one of them goes on this trip for their job. And when they come back, they're not quite right. And you get flashback scenes to what their relationship used to be like and where they are now and how like essentially one of the one person, the couple has lost their partner because of what happened. And it's very disturbing. Apparently there are body horror elements and it seems like a very fascinating exploration of grief. I will say that it's not necessarily, I think, about finding out what happened to this other person, which I think is important kind of to know going in. Cause I think if I went in with these flashback scenes, I'd be like, yeah, I want the answer. 
And I think some people who were disappointed didn't get an answer they thought was satisfying, and that wasn't really the point or the project of the book. Also, people kept mentioning the short story collection this author came out with, and I need to read it. I need to. <laughs> so I'm very compelled. It's very character focused. I think it's got a lot of those gothic trappings that you get. So yeah, I kind of want to read it because I think it's going to be such a um, bittersweet story about this relationship where it is now in our present day versus where it used to be and how did we get here. I think it's going to be one of those things that I find really gripping. So that's this recent release roundup. Let me know which one you find the most interesting on this list that I've brought forth today. Any that I am missing that you think I should have on my radar. And if you want to leave an emoji, oh, we have had a lot of horror. Um, our wives under the sea and we had a mermaid. So let's do a mermaid emoji. And otherwise, like if you liked it, subscribe if you want to, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye. Mm -hmm.